um, and um, inviting me to um, to this place also. Um, it's pretty nice to to be here. The work I will present today is joint work with my um, so far good colleague um, David Weimer, who's just leaving our place, and um, with uh, Peter Odisko, um, who's um, who used to be a researcher at the Danish Center for Social Science Research um, and is now moving to the private industry. Um, <laughs> maybe a little bit about this paper because it's a paper that had been around for a while and it fell a little bit asleep because it's based on older data so we didn't feel the urgency to finish but now as everybody gets new positions we decided to pick it up again and um, finally finish it as soon as we can re-access the data that is a little bit the challenge right now so <laughs> it's a moment where we also appreciate um, feedback very much i think the motivation is that well, we want to study social inequality in higher education, and we know that there is a that distance to higher education relates to to inequality in different ways, and um, that's something that's also well established in the literature. Um, generally, we know distance to college is um, detrimental for enrollment. People that live further away from universities, they enroll less often. Um, we also know that this um, in many cases relates to the, further, to the lower classes that um, on, average, on average live further away from universities. Um, and we can hypothesize at some um, people also think they have shown um, that lower classes are more affected by distance. So uh, a child from a less educated family that lives further away from university might be even more inclined not to, to study in higher education. The um, evidence on this, however, is, is kind of mixed. Um, there are papers that say um, no, um, and others they say yes. And if you look at the names of the authors, there's a, a correlation um, between um, uh, the broader geographic picture. It seems to be that the, the people that study this in the US find this effect um, in um, Switzerland and Germany not. And that maybe also makes a little bit sense given the um, larger geographic dif distances that um, they are just there in the US. Um, well, what we further know is that there is regional inequality in the provision of and enrollment into universities in Denmark. Um, that's, um, that's there. And it's a, also a super hot political topic right now because the last and the new governments, they try to move universities to the countryside to compensate for that but it yeah no surprise it doesn't really work out um but that's something that we also sometimes keep have in mind and um, actually when we come to the results you will see why some of our colleagues are not so happy about because these policies are of course extremely unpopular among um, academics so that's the <laughs> first concerns and um, report. Um, that's the, a map of Denmark, and um, the greener, the more higher education access possibilities. And you can see that it, it clusters around certain centers. You have more higher education in the three biggest city, uh, in the four biggest cities, of course, but the, the three, two to four that is Olbor, Aarhus, and Odense. And then you have this very dark black stain on the right hand side, and that's Copenhagen. And that's basically where uh, most of higher education is still centered in Denmark. Um, why would we think there is a link between 
um, higher education choices, inequality, and, and travel distance. Well, we think that um, people that take up higher education make some thoughts and then choose rationally because it's kind of a, seems an, an important decision. So what we think about is some kind of costs and expected returns that should drive the decision for higher education. And they're, of course, both intuitively clearly related to distance uh, to universities. Um, the costs for moving can be assumed to be particularly high for lower classes. There is the cost for relocation. There is financial aid for studies in Denmark, but um, it might not cover especially the full um, housing costs in, uh, in Copenhagen, but also the social costs like the um, local embeddedness in, um, in, in, in clubs and, and friendship networks and so on. Um, and um, the benefits are, are also higher if you live in a city uh, because there's, a, there's better job opportunities for highly graduates. So you may very early realize that um, the moving is prevalent. Um, now, what we rarely have are exogenous changes of these costs and benefits, um, especially of the travel distances. Um, at least in sort of a, a, a not broader scale. I mean, land isn't moving, right? So there, there's not much to do. Um, we can look at the establishment of new universities. That changes the costs. That does not change the benefits for taking up higher education. So that just changes the costs, reduces the costs. Um, but then, of course, you have a new university that might be something different than the old established universities. So that's uh, uh, an uncertain thing again. But um, the other source of, of, um, of changes is um, the change in travel distances due to a new traffic infrastructure. And this changes the cost of access to established university and to new labor market opportunities. And there is a little bit of research on that, but of course it doesn't happen that often that um, the travel time changes great deal in very short time. Um, there is this Frankfurt Seaport, Frankfurt Cologne high-speed train that got opened. That cuts the travel time by an hour. There's <laughs> some, some research done by economists on that that the sorting labor markets um, started after the constructing of this, of this link. Um, and I can personally relate to that because when I was working in Cologne, I think at least half of the department was um, still living in Mannheim and met on this train um, every morning or every other morning. Um, and in Denmark, there's there, there something similar happened. Um, uh, there was a, the construction of a bridge across the Great Belt, and that cut travel times from certain areas to Copenhagen by more than an hour. So we have a similar situation here as the opening of this um, high-speed railway in Germany. Now, a little bit background on the higher education um, situation in Denmark. There are two types of um, higher education institutions. They were actually, there's a first tier, that's universities. And then there's lower tier higher education that is diverse. And it was even more diverse in the 1990s, which is the period I'm, I'm looking at. But they're often short cycle, they're practically oriented. And these courses are not, um, I think the bachelor degrees they award are not counted as a bachelor degree under Bologna among other reasons, um, because they are not taught by people with a PhD usually. That's for example, teachers or kindergarten teachers. Um, so we focus on higher education today. The access is conditional on graduating from upper secondary education, from a gymnasium um, education, as it's called in, in, in Danish. Um, there are exceptions, but again, in this period, there were fewer exceptions than there are today, which is, I guess, kind of typical. 
Um, there's a nationwide admission system. Students apply to one office um, and they give up to eight preferences. And then there are different ways of getting admitted. Most students are admitted via the grades from upper secondary school. Um, there is also what's called a, a second quote where universities can design their own admission system for about 20% of the students. And that um, more based can be based on a test or on personal experiences and, and, and so on. But most of the students are admitted via the central uh, admission system and via the grade um, from upper secondary school. But it's not like the grade mattered uh, a great deal back then. I mean, it's few studies that are severely restricted by, by grades and many things can be studied without any um, limit on the GPA. Or they have technical love. Some say a GPA has to be at least a C or something. Um, yeah, and there can be, it's not so important for this year, but there, there can be other limitations. For example, um, some studies might require that you had a certain method of mathematics in, um, in gymnasium. Um, during the 1990s, and this is maybe uh, not the best um, representation, I, I picked out them from Statistics Denmark here, but what it shows you that is people that are 29 years old and have, uh, have a, a long higher education, so a master's degree, and you can see that this is like steadily, almost linearly increasing over the 1990s. Of course, this is people that started their education earlier, but you could also like draw the picture further and um, the time we're looking at i think the people we're looking at they were like around this area so there's a pretty linear increase and um if we look at this period um uh, enrollment doubled but um if we stretch it a bit we can easily find a period where enrollment tripled and that's quite late um educational expansion for europe that set off first in the 1990s. I mean, in many Western European countries, this was pro this was yeah progressed much further at that time actually. So uh, Denmark is often first mover here. It was actually a late mover. Okay, uh, the change in the travel time now. It, no, okay, the change in the travel time. What happened? Um, uh, yeah, it's actually movies, but I don't think I show you the movies now. Um, the, uh, in 1990, on, on June 1st, 1997, um, a new railroad was opened from this island, Fyn, to Sealand. Um, you can see that here in the, it's right in the middle of, of, of this little map. So from Nyborg to what's called Sleet, on the, the right hand side, there was a new railroad open that goes across. <laughs> and uh, before this, um, before the opening of this railroad, um, there was a railroad, but the train went on this ship. Uh, it was a famous ship that uh, had only one ship that went back and forth between these two places all the time. Um, train went on the ship. People went off the train, people had to go upstairs because if there's anything with the ship, um, they had to be safe. Then they had to go downstairs when they were on the other side, um, get on the train, train goes out of the ship. And this took about an hour 15, um, an hour 20, um, depending on the waiting times, maybe even an hour 30. Now you just take the train and it takes eight minutes to cross, um, to cross the water. Um, across a bridge and a, and a tunnel. So what we're taking from the from the clock is about an hour fifteen. Yeah. Um, so the travel time between the main town of Fyn, that's called Odense, um, was reduced from two hours uh, forty three to one hour twenty six. From yeah. like a small town Newborn, it was reduced to one hour thirty eight. <laughs> so. Before this was opened, it was not possible to attend a lecture at 9 a.m. in the morning, for example, and um, living on food. And um, after the opening, this became possible. And um, 
I'm one of uh, the initiators for the idea. It's a bit anecdotal, but I know it happens because I'm I'm teaching in Copenhagen, and when I take the train home to Aarhus, then I sometimes sit in the train with my students that go back to Florida. So it it seems to happen in some way. <coughs> now, um, what we look at is what we want to study empirically is changing enrollment patterns after the opening of the bridge um, or the Great Belt Link. We would expect. Um, that Copenhagen should attract more students from Fyn, and maybe the other way around. There's also a university in Odense. Um, we had also some ideas, but we haven't done that yet, and we don't know if we actually will do it. Um, that the spatial variation in application profiles should increase. So before maybe before the opening, um, students applied to whatever was offered locally. And now they apply consistently to their first preference field of study, but in different universities. That would be another hypothesis that we could actually test here. Haven't done that yet. Um, yeah. The range of studies that is uh, available locally and open is that versus Harvard's, but not Harvard's. Uh, Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Is it very different? Yes. Uh, yes. It is a. But I'm going to tell you something about this place in Odense because it is actually a problem. <laughs> um, you can study many things there, but you can study everything in Copenhagen. And you can, you know, I would say, and I hope there's no one from the University of Southern Denmark in the room, you can st study everything on a higher level in a, in a better university. Um, Copenhagen has universities like the Danish Technical University, uh, leading university in technical sciences. This would not be available. Um, I think they they opened at some point a medical program, so it's more stuff that is also needed locally. Um, the IT University of Denmark is in Copenhagen. The Education University of Denmark is in Copenhagen. Um, other big universities have a campus. Aalborg University has a campus in Copenhagen, and of course, Copenhagen University is sort of a leading university in many fields um, scientifically. So, it it was um, it created access to a much more attractive palette. There's also another university in Roskilde that has sort of a, like a liberal arts college where you can combine all sorts of crazy things, I would almost say, to a, to a bachelor's degree. Also, that became possible. And that's something that would not be available in um, in, in, in food or in, in Owens. But there is, there is an issue. I will come back to this. Um, <clears throat> now, we look at changing enrollment and application patterns by social origins. And the hypothesis is that the lower classes should benefit more from the proximity from the gain of proximity when the bridge was opened, um, while children from higher class backgrounds might have been more willing to move anyhow. That's at least one hypothesis one could reason for. Um, I'm aware that you could also turn that. Um, yeah. So that would mean more enrollments of children from the lower origins from Fuhn in the greater Copenhagen area and um, possibly in the prestigious programs there. What we uh, use as database is old um, Danish register data, where we link different registers, um, children's and parents' biographies. We don't really use the panel structure, but we have a panel structure. Um, and we also look, or we can add data. I think we have added in a very similar, uh, simple form, but. We also have this data there, um, data from the central admission system, um, where all students have to apply to university. That can also be linked to, to the other registers. And what we then do is a very simple, at least for what I have with me today, a very simple difference and difference um, estimation of our linear probability model for taking up university studies on Sealand before, after the um, Fix railroad crossing over the Great Belt was opened in 1997. Um, and then we look at food versus uh, comparison group uh, by social origin. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the comparison group. 
the moment. We, of course, look also at the reverse movement from Sealand um, to, to OILZ, but given the sort of restricted study portfolio of the university there, we, we don't expect much to happen there. We look at people um, that are age 18 to 29 and limits to those that are directly eligible but haven't started yet higher education. And what we then do with them is a, is a super simple, to begin with a super simple, um, yeah, diff and diff model, which um, most of you are familiar with, I guess. We also do more complex models as a buffer sex with um, uh, interactions with time and stuff, um, but that doesn't change our story. So we stay with this very simple one. Um, of course, we have to uh, assume parallel trends, and this is where we where we um, sort of struggle. And I'll show you that. Um, obviously, this model would be biased if anything else happened over time than the opening of the grids. And as it is in the real world, many things happen at the same time. So um, uh, we have to rely that on, on the assumption that they don't um, affect the enrollment behavior. And of course, there are some things that can interfere with that. Um, and that the composition of the groups um, is the same over time. I added that because sometimes when I presented that in other contexts, people were very worried that the social composition of the population on food would change over time. But I actually think that's a minor concern. And we can also test for that. That's not, um, that's not so, so problematic, I would say. So what we need, though, is um, now let's stay uh, briefly with the, the diff and diff model. So generally, the educational expansion was quite linear after 1992. So, um, so that's good. But the biggest problem is the expansion of um, other universities, and in particular, the university of uh, Southern Denmark that was rebranded or renamed in 1998. It used to be the University of Odense and then became the University of Southern Denmark with an increase in the capacity of in the enrollment capacity. And that's of course, sort of our biggest enemy here. We're, we're, we're struggling with them. Yeah? Or you could say that's the alternative um, explanation that we, we, we can analyze we've already added. Um, yeah, and what then of course, we are also, that's a limitation. Um, we can only look at a travel time reduction of one hour uh, 15 or something, and not at non-linearities or sensitivity to the amount of travel time reduction. Or neither can we really look at sort of the baseline differences in travel time, in travel time reduction. So we can't look at the person that, I mean, if, if you live one and a half hours from a university and that gets cut down to um, 15 minutes, um, that might make a much, much bigger impact on you. And so we, we can't analyze that. We only got what we got um, and that's this one hour 15. Um, and still there's a substantive commute left with about one and a half hours, right? One hour, 15 also. Um, and of course, um, the control group that we look at must be unaffected by the intervention. So um, we, we, we cannot choose a control group that was in any way in the enrollment behavior affected by the opening of the bridge. Uh, and that's um, where we invested some thoughts in, of course, ideally, you would like to have people that live east of Copenhagen. But remember, Copenhagen is, 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 is here. Huh? So east of Copenhagen, there's the sea. So we can't, uh, we can't go there to select the control group. We thought about islands. There's one island, but it's too small. The number 16 island, that's actually quite a bit east of Copenhagen, but it, it doesn't make sense. It's too small a population. Um, and so we have three options. And this is actually an old, geographical, uh, geopolitical structure of Denmark. At that time, Denmark was, um, yeah, was, was organized in these units that are called Amt, and they had numbers. They don't exist anymore, but we use them. Um, 
And there's three possibilities of, of UMPs that we could use as um, comparison um, regions. One would be to say, we go all the way to the south, to the German border, because these people still have so much commute left to Copenhagen, um, they won't be really affected by the Kutch. Um, the other option is to go on this island of Zealand and look at the number six and the number seven um, here. Um, but then the problem is, of course, that many of them are already quite close to Copenhagen before the opening of the bridge, and others are might actually be affected reversely because they moved much closer to um, to Odense. Um, so what we did in order to tackle that is that we um, we went to the library and asked them for old um, uh, train timetables. And we were the first people to check them out, so it took them a while to find them and to put their, their, their barcodes and stickers on it, but then we, we got them. Um, and the librarian always wished me safe travels when I checked out such a book and was really happy about his joke. Um, <laughs> and then um, we um, went through them and um, we, we, looked at, uh, we, we looked at possible comparison groups in the, in the timetables, you could say. So we, we selected these two umps here, the number six and number seven umps. And then uh, for each individual, we, we created, uh, oops, where are we? Here, we, we created the, the travel time to Copenhagen before the opening of the, of the Great Belt Lake. So we had that in the data. And then we used, um, we, we, we grouped it, we coarsened it as well, and used then exact matching, um, yeah, based on this travel distance to make the travel distance before the opening of the link to Copenhagen balanced for both groups between those that live on Fyn and those that live in these two regions um, in Zealand. And we and that made that most comparison cases are matched from this um, that is called Storstrom's um, and only very few from West Zealand. So most of the comparison cases come from down here um, around these islands. And we almost make all of them that that should not be. Um, but then we have um, we have the travel distance unbalanced. We also did um, consistency checks with our robustness checks with this um, number nine and ten, um, uh, but that's I think a way less interesting analysis um, than the ones with the matching on on travel distance. Yeah, what, what we basically do is we we search for for matches for people that have the same travel distance as those that get affected on um, on food. Um, it's explained here, I think most, for most of you, this should be intuitive that um, we basically drop people from the comparison group that have no um, twin um, with the same travel distance in the treatment group or on food. And if we have um, multiple people in the comparison group, then we weight them. So we get a, so we, we match one to many, of course. If we have more possible comparison cases, then they go into the comparison group, but they get assigned a weight. Um, so mm -hmm. the sample is balanced in the end. Yeah. Do you only match on distance or any other? We also match on. Um, we also match on, we, we did for the principal analysis, we match on social origin, we match on and, and, and parental income and this stuff, but we, then we don't do it, we do sub-analysis. Um, we match on migration status, family size, and age. For fun, we also matched on sex, but it's not really any concern here, yeah. Um, could be if the gymnasium attendance rates of girls and boys are different in two regions, but that's, that's minor. Um, and, and these things, they didn't remove anybody. I mean, what really changes the sample is the, is the travel distance. Um, the other things were kind of balanced without, without much ado. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> so the treatment is um, people living on Foon and only those who have a post-travel time of uh, 120 minutes, because otherwise we don't think they move into this commutable window. Um, yeah, and then we do all these comparisons. But the main comparison is actually with this matched uh, control group. And then we have different ways of operationalization. In this, we do just before, just after. Um, and we do before versus after with a longer time span, um, with year fixed effects, with linear trends, with interactions and these things. Um, so that's the raw data. Um, this is oh, I have to see. this is trends in enrollment um, by a place of, of residence, and this is people enrolling on Sealand, um, and um, they are by these different um, amps. And the the blue line is people living on Foon. Um, so this is the most interesting group. Um, the Control groups are in the red and the, the red and the yellow line. And what you can already see, like <laughs> where the story goes, this blue line is extremely flat. It's as flat as, as flat can be, right? Um, and now um, the alternative or the opposite direction, share enrolling on food by place of, uh, of residence. And now you can see that the blue line actually takes off. And it takes off especially after the bridge was opened. And this is the, the university capacity uh, increasing at roughly the same time, actually a little later. So the directly before after analysis should not be affected by that. But as soon as we look into a broader window, this, of course, is very much also in the data that there's a new opportunity or more opportunities to go to university on food. And that is basically also almost the story, because when we do that with all sorts of different models, we arrive at very small, though positive estimators. So these are linear probability models. So this is changes in probabilities for enrolling. Um, in the greater Copenhagen area. And um, you could, if, you, if you're happy with small coefficients, you could see that sometimes it looks like there's a two percentage point change, but it's never ever um, statistically significant. Um, there is, however, if we look at this enrollment on Foon and Postbridge, and then living on Foon Postbridge, there is a significant increase. If I just look at the before after effects, um, yeah, for local enrollment. So this is this, this blue line that is increasing that also um, shows shows up um, in the in the models, and this is like almost independent. Of the of the model, it's not here, but this is the weird. This Suleyland. This is the this is the weird comparison group. Um, so I wouldn't wouldn't look too much at that. Um, that's actually animated. Oh, okay. Good. Now this is um, people whose parents do not have higher education because maybe they are more affected. And what you can see is no, they're not. I mean, these coefficients are so small, especially the important left one is so small um, that if even if it would become statistically significant for any bad reason, um, we wouldn't, um, yeah, we, we wouldn't um, make much out of it. Um, but again, like the local enrollment pattern, here we have a significant pseudo effect of the bridge or a, a parallel effect of the opening of the, the new university uh, spaces. That is quite substantive. I mean, six percentage points, additional increase, that is, uh, that is, quite, a, that is quite a change. Um, 
Um, this is for parents with higher education, and here it gets a little interesting. Um, still no effect for enrollment um, in Copenhagen, but an even bigger effect um, for the local enrollment. So we're getting up to 9 percentage points here. And that's actually quite, I mean, that's, that's quite a lot. And it's also quite a bit more than we had for the um, less educated or less privileged kids. So I marked this with a, with a Christmas star and, uh, to, to remind everybody that this is quite a substantive um, change. I'm sorry, what is the baseline? Yeah. So what is the share that there was bigger than the average higher education grants? Uh, it's a good question because it's... probably than the other one. Because the higher share of those. Yeah, it is a high, it's a much higher baseline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't, I mean, it, 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 I'm the talk, it, it's those that are eligible. That's why I'm struggling a bit. Um, but it, I, yeah. I think we're talking about the middle of the percentage range. Yeah. Like, because it's only university, right? And there's also a, an alternative to go to the short cycle of higher education. So, it's so, so that of course makes the effect smaller again. If we have 50, 60 percent, then it's not that much a high percentage point change. Yeah, it's definitely not something that goes close to, to the 100. But I, I don't know if the exact um, number is a good point. Um, no, okay. And then, um, if we only look at the city of Olsen, and this is where sort of the strongest, the best effect on the travel time was, but also the strongest treatment or the most local increase of university spaces. And I can make the story short. I mean, the effects don't get bigger for the, for the bridge to Copenhagen. There's nothing happening in that direction, but they get even bigger for um, the local enrollment. So the local enrollment was even more triggered by the opening of um, of new university capacities in in the directly in the city, um, <clears throat> the same. Um, no, we, I I can't see everything here on the on the screen, so I always have to see. This is without higher education. Um, there's it's also bigger um, for people that that live in in uh, in Olsen, but. The increase is even 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 bigger for um, yeah children from highly educated families that that live in in Olense. So so this also gets a star here. Um, so in conclusion, our results I would say they are preliminary in the sense that we could add more analysis on 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 different outcomes especially maybe on these profiles, application profiles. I think they're not really preliminary on the conclusion that we cannot observe um, a strong increase in enrollment in Sealand from Thun. We saw actually in some constellations smaller effects. It's especially if we, if we stretch it a bit and look into long-term, but then of course also confoundedness gets a bigger issue. So for here, I would say, uh, the uh, the infrastructure change, it's it, it's at least it would be too brave to say it had any effect. Um, there's a very low stable local enrollment pattern that dominates the smaller changes. If we observe some in the enrollment across the Great Belt, that seems to be much 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 more important. Um, so if at all, and that was something I didn't really follow up, in, if we look at these very small numbers, they're actually a tiny bit bigger for um, privileged um, children. So if at all, which increases the gap. Um, and, and if we if we had to come with a policy recommendation, we, we would probably say it looks like um, bringing universities to the people or Seems, seems to be the more promising way of increasing higher education than um, bringing people to universities. Um, but it's also clear that this is um, with a higher proportion being used by upper class children. Um, 
And it seems to be more effective if the university moves very close. Yeah. And then we did a couple of robustness checks that did not change the results in a meaningful way. And there's some um, outlook um, where we go from here. Um, and I brought one picture. This one on the way here. It's still very nice to take that bridge. It has a lot of advantages. For example, I couldn't have come to Budapest then if I couldn't have come to Copenhagen first to fly. Um, but what we want to do is analyzing the preferences um, in these application profiles um, in a more holistic way, um, which that was actually from another presentation. They have been on the server for a while now, but we have, don't have access because Peter doesn't work there anymore. Um, but we would analyze commuting. Uh, we, we could also analyze commuting instead of studying. Um, we did a quick check whether people start to work um, in uh, in Zealand because it's also interesting for us because I mean maybe actually the uh, the, the new working opportunities in Copenhagen they partly also trigger the more frequent enrollment locally because actually it gives you access to uh, jobs with the education that you can still get locally. So that would be sort of an, another question we could we could look at here. And um, we could analyze um, more variation in um, higher education access or distance to higher education with other changes, especially with the opening of so-called satellite campuses in Western Shetland that are far out in the countryside, which um, several universities in Denmark did over time and are doing again now because they're being forced to that by, by politicians. Um, yeah, thanks for listening and I'm looking forward to, to comments. Yeah, um, I wasn't sure. So, in the different in, um, in Copenhagen, what is so? Are you looking at those before and after? Who was active? so you know the, the uh, home address of the children as well? So, you were so you know that before they were living in from on them and then um, and went to Copenhagen and. We compare those who actually went there and both yes. still doing that. Yes. If the, if they had moved to Copenhagen three years before, then we don't. Then 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 they are in Copenhagen for us. We look at those that move after the opening or yeah. 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 So it's their actual address. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean it's tricky, right? <clears throat> you, yeah. It, they might have moved back even or something like that and then commute. So it's a bit, but we also look at moving. I mean, we, we, we look at both at moving and, but that was not here. We, we, and it seems that there's no big reduction in moving to Copenhagen mm -hmm. um, because that's also a possibility, right? That we observe more enrollment because they're just not moving there. But there wasn't really. People want people move to Copenhagen not because it's far, they move to Copenhagen because they want to live there. Yeah. Oh. So what about the labor market and the housing uh, after this bridge was constructed? Because I think that this enrollment might also be simply just impacted by those job opportunities and the housing conditions mm -hmm. uh, might have changed as well and all this is something which is obviously a type of uh, thing uh, just because of the fact that the bridge was announced and the bridge, uh -huh. bridge was built and uh -huh. something which is you know people who are playing in this film might simply just uh, uh, build in their so-called rational expectation the rational mm -hmm. uh, Similar studies which are doing something on the localization effect of this or that uh, play with the exogenous shocks. So, because this is an endogen, endogen, endogen something. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just think of uh, the uh, earthquake or other, other type of events. What, what is the impact on the business? Yeah. Uh, that of this? Yeah. this issue 
something we just uh, restrain on the so called uh, visible first round effect, I think is only part of the picture. The second mm -hmm. round effect may also play a role. Mm -hmm. And in this respect, the interpretation of the coefficient might be somewhat misleading if you are simply just attributing them to the construction of the bridge mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I mean, there is a stable gap in housing prices between Copenhagen and the rest of the country. So nothing, nothing but I can't, uh, I mean, I can't say if the the, 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 there's like small changes in, the, in, 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 in this, but it's definitely always the case that if you move, you increase the cost for housing by a lot. That's, um, there could be like, there, there could, it could actually be worth checking to if there's a, a, a huge race, but they came actually, this like this housing bubbles, they came later in Denmark, that it really became an issue, mm -hmm. this, this super steep price hikes, because it's quite like the housing market is quite strongly or used to be even more regulated by the government. Um, but actually, it's something we, 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 we should um, check, I think. Um, and what would be the alternative? Uh, for example, that we would help or subsidize the dormitory construction. Yeah. And what is the situation in that time? So then, uh, what is the share of students who got some some subsidization for their accommodation or whatever? They get all the students get sort of a, a, a stipend, and that's okay. enough if you get into a dormitory and. The situation is comparatively good in Copenhagen. We have a good chance of getting into that. Um, yeah, but then it's, the, the, the standard is not very high. But that's that that is kind of possible. But what you see is they don't move anyhow, right? So so staying at home is maybe what, uh, staying at home commuting could be an alternative um, for them, and apparently isn't. Um, another pricing issue is the price of the tickets that didn't of the train tickets that didn't change, but. It wasn't super cheap to admit. I mean, it was, I think it's possible for a student living at home, it would still be cheaper to commute than renting in Copenhagen, even renting a dorm. But it's not like they, they, these, these super cheap student tickets that they sometimes have in, 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 in countries where you can travel. In Germany, you, I don't know, 30 euros and you travel the entire state something for a monthly ticket. That's not like that. They didn't have something like that. And uh, finally, uh, you, uh, by construction, you left out uh, all the students from your analysis group. Yes. And uh, maybe they were enrolled before and afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should look at that, whether there is any sort of change in there. Whether they push the others out or? I don't know, I don't know. I, I have I've never looked at the Danish enrollment data <laughs> yeah. uh, by, by, by nationality of students, but I, my research is I have had simply just uh, take into account that whether they have, uh, so to say, for very closely the construction of the bridge. Yeah, the foreign students. I'm just looking for that. No, I mean, there's the other bridge to Sweden that was built much later. So <laughs> the main foreigners, I think, in that area. What do you share of for your students in Danish? Higher education. Um, it changes all the time. It was pretty low because at that time they almost had no English studies. And then, it's, oh, that's, that's and then if you want to read in Danish, then you, before, there is, there might be actually a point. And I, and I, I want to look into that now you say it. Um, there is, they have, to, Denmark has to accept all EU students if they are willing to read um, in Danish. So that's not that many. As soon as Denmark opens English study places, the foreign students come many. There is one specific thing with Norwegians and that I should maybe check because they can read Danish and they want to they wanna study medicine in Denmark, but it's only for medicine. And they get a special quota because they're not EU students. Okay. So they have sort of, there's a specific, and if that already existed, let's say that got increased a lot, then many of them pushed out or took some of the capacity in Copenhagen. 
something like that could change. I mean, I would be worried if we we actually we looked at single subjects. I didn't show that psychology, for example, like really sort of hard to get in subjects. If we looked at medicine, I think then we should definitely take this issue of the Norwegians um, into account. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I want to have a look at that. But I, I think in that time, I mean, the Erasmus students and so on, they don't count into the uptake of universities, so they don't push out the, um, the, the other students. Well, this is a follow-up question. Uh, have you looked at the, uh, uh, so you mentioned that in Copenhagen you can study everything, and in Norden it's just a couple of uh, programs, right? Yeah. So have you looked at looked at those programs in Copenhagen which didn't have a pair in them, and then what have what would happen with the same uh, design? Not because systematically. Yeah. Because that would you know then yeah. then your story of opening or or uh, extending uh, the program is only that doesn't shouldn't affect the. Uh, mm. Yeah, and I think that's part of what we want to do with application profiles, because that mainly makes sense if you also have that in Olympia. So the second option maybe is particularly interesting, right? If the second option, if I if I apply for something that is hard to get in in Olympia, is my second option something that I can definitely get there? So is it then if it was psychology, do I then choose sociology in Olympia? doesn't exist there, but something else that is easy to get in, or is it psychology in Copenhagen? So this is something we have in mind for, um, yeah, for these profiles. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so what I'm thinking about is that the bridge also opened up to the labor market. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's not just easier to get to the universities or the direct course to go to the university are going to be lower, but it's also easier to get better jobs. So the alternative course of going to be even higher, and maybe that's why you can sometimes much for the friend a high or, or any effect for, for the Copenhagen direction, because that's probably the better labor market. Yes, yes. No, I, I think it could be part of the story, and we can't and really... Be, and yeah. I, so yeah. can check. I mean, you yeah. have a big up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, would you mean check? I mean, I know the labor market is better in Copenhagen for academics, or for academics. You know, in, in this particular age group with this exact same design. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. We, it's, it's not analysis looking at the, the yeah, okay, yeah. But you're not, not studying, but don't get work, work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's true. We could actually analyze this hypothesis that Maybe they study in they study in Odense just to get a job later in Copenhagen because that got more accessible with the opening of the bridge. Yeah. I mean, they even want university because they rather take up a job, right? Like yeah. Age fifteen. Yeah, I mean, those that don't study, they they take up a job, right? Yeah. I mean, there's very few that don't do anything. Well, uh, I'm not saying that you know, if you give, give uh, somebody who have two options, either study or or uh, or work. And now a, a better paying job. Oh. Okay, so the alternatives. Yeah, so the alternative courses are doing that because these two jobs are easily. <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, okay, I thought we would have to check. Actually, there I'm not so sure. That's, that's a empirical question because I'm not so sure if there's a net gain or, like, let's say, a carpenter, uh, because the living costs are higher. But they can commute. They can commute, yes, definitely. That's the yeah. that, you know, being a carpenter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or okay. Yeah. And commuting or yeah. going to a uh, uh, That could be. At least the carpenters in Aarhus are much more expensive than those 20 kilometers outside. Uh, experience. <laughs> yeah. So that could be, yes. But, yeah. But that could be that the so so the, the vocational education gets also more attractive. Uh, it, it, it's people that come from gymnasium, so yeah, it's it could be the case, but <laughs> they have already made a choice towards the academic um, towards the academic track. That's I think we should keep in mind. The different type of question is there a reason why? You do not include the short cycle on um, tertiary education. 
yeah, I believe the access to them didn't really didn't really improve, right? Could be almost a placebo test, actually. Have to think about it. I don't know. Um, because there is, I mean, there is also short cycle on the other side. And short cycle generally is much more regionalized or localized. Mm -hmm. So I think if we would have a huge effect, a positive effect, I would think it's a good placebo test. Mm -hmm. But if it's, it's like that, I don't know really what to what to gain from them. I mean, they they have they have really a very localized model. So they have already done this, bringing the the, the studies to the students. But I have to think about it actually, so, um, if we can get something out of that. It was there a very large influx of um, people from ex Yugoslavia in the same time at this time, or uh, that happened later? We ex that, no, it wasn't that time. We excluded them, and we we took only people with I think parents had to have Danish nationality or had to have lived there, and so and they had to have a Danish. Um, actually, I don't know what happened to them if they could go to university with Jewish Navy in gymnasium. I don't know really. I uh, could check that. It's really, um, I mean, if it's many, it might be the same as with the foreign students. Yeah. They could push out others after they learned Danish, of course. But if they more came as refugees and then went back and did not study in universities, um, uh, I tend to believe they were not in large numbers. But I could check. Ukrainians are not there. I haven't seen a single one in universities. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay.